And it is another episode of the Business Wrap-Up. The UBC business team has come together to just cite out exactly those stories that made news this week. Let's take a look at those stories. Come July 31st of this month, all airtime dealers in the country will be required to return all the stock of airtime in form of scratch cards to their respective telecom companies in exchange for the equivalent of electronic airtime. I spoke to Bosa Ibrahim, the manager of Consumer Affairs in UCC. Many citizens confused the UCC ban of airtime scratch cards with the mobile money tax. But according to the UCC Consumer Affairs Office, the occurrence was coincidental. The ICT sector is usually driven by technology. And we have known for a while that uh, scratch cards, being a paper version of uh, loading airtime, has its inconveniences, both to consumers but also to the operators. For the part of the consumers, we have been dealing with a lot of uh, complaints where people basically, the scratch cards are poorly uh, scratched. Somebody is not able to load their airtime. That means you have to contact your operator. Sometimes it takes you more than a day or two uh, before you can actually get the situation uh, resolved. Or somebody bought a scratch card and they lost it. There have also been some, um, some criminal issues where scratch cards are being left at scenes of crime. But also the operators have had issues whereby scratch cards you know, have to be imported because they are printed from outside the country. They have to be cleared in, in custom. They have to be warehoused. Then they have to be distributed to every corner of the country. So yeah, you're talking about road transportation and so on. And that is why we have some areas in this country where scratch cards had a markup. You pay a little extra than the face value of the scratch cards. UCC estimates that there are 24 million mobile phone subscribers, of whom 23.3 million have active mobile money accounts. Therefore, 94% of phone subscribers can load airtime using mobile money accounts. So in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, uh, Etopap provides an opportunity for the entire distribution system to be more effic effective, more efficient, less pro pro problematic, because once you have loaded, you have loaded the records on loading. There's what we call the, the data records, the electronic digital trail of somebody having loaded airtime. So we expect that that one would basically uh, probably provide a saving. The new method of loading airtime and data saves money for both telecom companies and customers. So UCC will have to ensure that telecom companies provide stable mobile money networks and maintain fair trading terms to facilitate the use of electronic airtime. So in that effect, we feel as a government that uh, the systems are mature and we only have to get around the mentality. Change is always difficult. We, we had a, dig, a, a, a shift from analog to digital migration recently. That change was not easy, it is difficult. But we believe that customers in this instance have nothing to worry about. The very person who has been selling you a scratch card this time round, when you go to buy the scratch card next month, will instead be selling you e top up. So it is only the, the form in which the airtime is coming and not any other issues that are being introduced. Come 31st of July 2018, the traders that sell airtime in form of scratch cards are going to be required to take it back to the telecom companies just so that they get the equivalent of e-airtime. Reporting for UBC TV, Wadulo Mark Arnold. Now those of you who have been following the social media and mobile money tax, you know it's still trending. The excise duty amendment bill 2018 that faced rejection from the public has finally returned to the parliament on orders of the president. In a letter addressed to the speaker of parliament, President Museveni asked the parliament to do more scrutiny on the amendment before it is reconsidered. 
I am the receipt of the communication from the Secretary to the President on the tax procedure. On May 30th, Parliament passed the Excise Duty Amendment Bill 2018 that imposed a 200 shillings tax levy on social media platforms per day and a 1% tax levy on all mobile money transactions. The bill that was aimed at generating revenue from untaxed items so as to broaden the tax base of the country, however, suffered rejection by the public even before its implementation. <laughs> In a letter addressed to the Speaker of Parliament, President Yoweri Museven rejected a tax procedures amendment bill, asking Parliament to review it. Honourable members, I am the receipt of a communication from the Secretary to the President on the tax procedure amendment bill 2018, which has been returned to Parliament for a consideration. Rule 142.1 provides that when a bill passed by the House is returned to the House for the president with a message that the house should be considered a bill or any specific provision of it or any such amendment as recommended in his or her message. The speaker shall read the message of the president. Deputy Speaker Jacob Olanya on Tuesday told MPs that the President had returned the tax bill to the House for reconsideration owing wrong procedures of amendment. In accordance with Article 91 3B of the Constitution, I hereby return the tax procedure amendment bill 2018 to Parliament. Quoting Article 91, Section 3B of the Constitution, the President considered returning the Tax Procedure Amendment Bill 2018 to Parliament, citing likely tax evasion by some persons or organizations. He also recommended Section 20, Subsection 6 to be deleted, citing likely non compliance by taxpayers and encouraging leakages. The proposed amendment will further deter the American authority from charging interest on tax arrears. It would have Although the bill is back to Parliament, it's already an act whose implementation will continue as the committee scrutinizes it. The bill takes a minimum of 40 days to return to the House for reconsideration. The President's rejection of the Tax Procedure Amendment Bill 2018 comes days after he made a U-turn on the controversial excise duty bill that was passed by Parliament in May 2018. Susan Naonga reporting. On to the agriculture sector. Coffee farmers in Rakai district risk losing all their harvest due to poor handling. Patrick Chin, to the LC5 chairman of Rakai, threatened to confiscate and dispose of coffee that is prematurely harvested and also improperly handled. Chin, to issued a stern warning at the 8th anniversary celebrations of both ministries in Chotera, Rakai district. Dennis Sigoa gave us this report. Rakai District is one of the model districts in Uganda in coffee production and consumption. It is estimated that at least 80% of the coffee produced in the district is consumed by the locals. However, the district chairman, Patrick Chintut Sekuro, has threatened to confiscate and dispose of coffee that is improperly handled. <laughs> If they find you with coffee which is not ready and you have just put it from the garden to the ground, they take it away from you. And even the police is not supposed to take it to the, to the station because if they take it to the station, they're going to sell it. So what we do, we get, let's say, flowing water, we, we power it there, we can, we can just put it in a, on the a ground where we see you cannot come and pick it. For the National Union of Coffee Agribusiness and Farm Enterprises, Nukafe says such harsh measures should be enforced by law. It is always important to follow the rules, to follow the law. And the law should always catch up with anybody that does wrong. For anybody to do that, let us first and foremost get the coffee law out and then we follow how the law prescribes.
This was during Hope Ministries' 8th anniversary celebrations held in Chotera, Rakai District. The church-leaning organization has been actively engaging farmers in enhancing coffee production and value addition. History has it that when AIDS was on its highest in this area, um, we had so many organizations, but when organizations left, we were left back with the church. So we organized the church to start our farmer groups through the local churches, and that's what we do. Every church has a farmer group of 20 farmers, and now as I speak, from 2010 with the seven farmers, we are now 2,300 farmers to date. Uganda is currently Africa's second largest coffee producer after Ethiopia. In 2017, Uganda exported at least 4.6 million bags of coffee. However, stakeholders feel the exports are way below the country's potential of 20 million bags per season. Dennis Ikoa for UBC News. The Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, has cautioned the government against unplanned or sometimes unnecessary spending. Addressing delegates at the annual Bankers Conference, Keith Muhakanizi aired his grievances on supplementary budgets, which he said impacts negatively on service delivery. The Bankers' fourth annual conference was graced by the Prime Minister, Dr. Ruhakana Rugunda. Also present was Matia Kasaija, the Minister of Finance. The annual Bankers' Conference sought to bring to speed the banking sector on the new technological developments in the global ecosystem. According to Wilbur de War, the executive director, Uganda's Bankers' Association, the mobile money technology in Africa, has presented an opportunity to drive financial inclusion amongst the unbanked and the underbanked. The theme of this year's conference is obviously managing risk uh, in this fast-changing and growing sector which is very critical to the economy. Um, the sector while growing we recognize that the more we are using technology there are risks that come um, with that but also the business models are changing and therefore we must take stock of the risk elements in there. However various issues were discussed that are of social economic importance as highlighted by the Premier and the Finance Minister. Framework have been put in place to increase outreach of financial services, especially in rural areas. We expect and call upon banks to leverage this framework to extend financial services to the unbanked and underbanked. Today, disruptions of financial sector have been minimized and in all recent instances of bank stress, the Central Bank of Uganda has intervened in a prompt manner and has been able to transfer assets or travel to financial institutions to other banks through purchase of assets and assumptions of liabilities. At a time when Uganda's economy is struggling and new tax measures have attracted massive condemnation in almost all forums, the Permanent Secretary, Minister of Finance, urged government to check on its spending, especially on supplementary budgets. The ministers of finance present a balanced budget. So when you give supplementaries, it means you are cutting from X, sometimes in most cases the weak ones, because you cut from the powerful ones. You'll be, you'll be hungry. <laughs> but, and then give it to the, those who want supplementaries. What does that, that, that mean? If an accounting officer, today I was in the parliament, being skilled, skilled about to, uh, how I appoint an accounting officer, where I have to put them back. Yes, if I have issued a certain, don't forget uh, areas. Mastercard, a headline sponsor of the conference, made a commitment to connect more than 100 million Africans and 500 million people worldwide to formal financial infrastructure by 2020. We talk about making payments faster, more convenient and safer. So the safer element of it is where we uh, invest a lot of time and effort and money in um, building fraud resources and fraud capabilities. Dennis Igoa for UBC News in Kampala. The 
Indian community in Uganda is anxious and excited about the upcoming state visit of the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Since ascending to the helm of leadership in India in 2014, Modi is credited for fast-tracking India's socio-economic development. Modi's visit will be the third to East Africa after visiting Kenya and Tanzania a few years back. In this UBC documentary, we take stock of India's and Uganda's bilateral ties, which date back as far as the 19th century. Uh, Shri Narendra Modi, he has visited Uganda once as a chief minister of Gujarat, but uh, he is visiting first time as a prime minister of India. And uh, what his visit means to us, see, the return of investment is highest in Africa all over the world. And the message has to go to all other business houses in the world and especially to India that come to Uganda, invest here and do business. The, the climate of Uganda is, is uh, very welcoming, the people are so welcoming and it's a, one of the virgin market and uh, because of the uh, East African uh, Union there is a huge market available if the investors come to Uganda. He has been third largest popular leader in the world today in terms of popularity. So he has done a magic in fan following. Mm -hmm. Let me give a little bit background of, uh, as you mentioned, that let me give a little bit background of uh, who is Narendra Modi. Good. As Narendra Modi is a very hardworking person, first I would like to put it that way. Mm -hmm. He has worked like our, uh, His Excellency, our President, the way he works hard. He's also the same stretcher of hardworking person whom how I know. From last four years, he took a position as a Prime Minister of India. He has not gone into single day for a vacation. So you can imagine. The Indians in Uganda are investing in different sectors of the economy. So uh, is it possible to bring us up to speed about the sectors where Indians are investing and how are they performing? Glad to tell you that yes, uh, Indians are investing in a very big way in all the sectors. Wow. But major focus, the way I see, definitely at irrigation. Many investors are looking at it. There is a, whoever I have talked, mm -hmm. they have been talking, there is a big scope in irrigation. In agriculture. In, agriculture. Mm -hmm. in service industries. Since oil and gas industry is going to take off in the next couple of years. There are many associated related business services of, you know, related to oil and gas is coming across. I can tell you also in IT, India is a hub here and in IT a lot of people are eyeing towards it that how they can do You talk about in tourism, Indian origin people are getting approached that how we can explore Uganda is a destination of tourism. Unlike my fellow Chinese, they've just started popping up in the last 20 years. We, if you, if you look at globally, last 100 years, wherever Indians have gone, they've stabilized into their country and tried to work within the available opportunities to improve the economic section of the country. Of course, Uganda is a new entrant into the oil and gas market, and we have a lot of things to learn uh, from our, our brothers and sisters internationally. And uh, Uganda, of course, has uh, been in uh, active in oil and gas for the last 10 years, but it has not gone into the production stage, which is what now we are aiming for. Mm -hmm. And I think the Indian companies, has, uh, or uh, companies from India, has a lot of expertise in those areas. If you look at it, uh, the biggest Indian multinational oil and gas company is ONGC, who has already the interest in South Sudan and Sudan for many years. Mm -hmm. They are one of the production partners there. There's another Indian company who is a world leader in refining with Reliance. 
uh, which is uh, the biggest uh, refinery in, uh, in the world is in India. Uh, there are other EPC companies from India, l &T, who has done the pipeline in Tanzania. There is a company called Dotsal in Tanzania who is doing the drilling. There is another company called Venomex who has the licenses in Kenya. So there are a lot of Indian companies and Indian origin companies who can help Uganda to achieve his vision and his aim uh, to go into the oil and gas phase because uh, this definitely means a lot of expertise uh, and this can only be uh, achieved uh, with the help of uh, already gained expertise internationally and I think Indian uh, companies can help not only in uh, uh, from the company point of view but also training the Ugandans because they are, of course we need a lot of welders, we need a lot of fabricators, we need a lot of uh, uh, handling uh, uh, operators, uh, truck drivers who are specialized into moving this kind of cargo and that is what uh, I think Indian uh, companies, Indian expertise can come and train your garments. Uh, there's a perception of the public if uh, we are rich that Indians make money in Uganda and repatriate almost all the profits back into India, probably in India, or some of them of course have investments elsewhere. Do you agree with this school of thought? Is it true? Is that a, a school of thought, right? Or is it a false? So unlike multinational companies, if you compare uh, the Indian business houses with any multinational companies, I don't want to put specific name, they have put one industry from 20 years, there is only one industry there. Mm -hmm. But the Indian business community have grown from one industry, they may be entered into another industry, to another industry, and that, that proves and shows that the money was not repatriated. Most of the money was kept in Uganda to develop their Ugandan economy. Even people are investing in the properties, they bought houses, they are staying here. Mm -hmm. So where the money has gone out, no. The were brought here by the British because they were uh, forced to come here as laborers to build the railway from Mombasa to Kampala. Though you can see the Amin's era is uh, ended with uh, we also know that the current government, the NRM, they are supporting the investors, they are trying all uh, that how the new investment to come, they are giving them all the uh, possible uh, uh, way to work uh, with the harmony and the atmosphere for investors is definitely good. Let me tell you, Idi Amin is history and uh, we don't even think about it, we don't even discuss about it. Whatever happened at that time is history and it should be laid to rest in history. Today, the coming of our Prime Minister marks a new era in the relationship between India and Uganda. We are hoping that with this, a lot of new investment will come from India into this country. So, it is uh, Uganda has transformed a big way since uh, we, uh, when I came in and uh, now. It used to be a seller's market when we came. People used to put the cash on hand and wait in the line to purchase the things. The seller was the, because nothing was available here. So people has to buy it in cash and has to limited uh, sellers. So now the situation is completely different. So now it is a buyer's market. Sellers has to reach to the customers and explain the products and all those things. So the business has grown in a multifold, and uh, this is basically our uh, uh, president of Uganda and uh, his vision to grow this country into a, also a big uh, uh, country in the at least in Africa, and also people should recognize. So the economy has uh, started growing very fast, and I've seen a big change. And uh, this is a credit should go to our president, uh, His Excellency. Uh, uh, um, I'm so sure you've been following up on Uganda's budget. Uh, the 2018-19 budget sent us, uh, sent us on industrialization. As the guys uh, who are out there who own and run industries, do you think Uganda is on track as far as industrialization is concerned? About cost of doing business and industrialization, Uganda is one of the first countries uh, in Africa to do the business. The cost of doing business is a bit high because of the power and, and some other reasons. And about industrialization, this country has to do a lot. Because in the East African community, Kenya and Tanzania are big brothers. And they are taking the maximum benefit about the East African community. Uganda is lacking there. And we need to protect our Ugandan industry or find some creative solution so that the big brothers does not leave us behind. 
And uh, in this budget, one important thing which I have noted is that instead of increasing the tax base in the country, the budget is milking the same cow again and again. I think in all over the world, the efforts needs are being made and need to be made in Uganda also to increase the tax base in the country instead of milking the same cow. If you will too much milk the same cow to pay as much tax as possible, that company or industry will die. And here the policy makers need to think on that one. Indians residing in Uganda, we are only 0.07% of the total population. But we contribute to the national budget 60% of the revenue. That is a point to be noted. Mm -hmm. And the Indian community or the Indian business houses are leaders in the various sectors of the economy. You name it as a printing, you name steel, you name construction, you name IT, you name sugar, you name tea. The Indian business houses are the leaders in most of the economic sectors of Uganda. We have some wish list which we have given to our Prime Minister's office, to the High Commission, and we are expecting that India has not yet allowed the dual citizenship. Yes. And if India allows dual citizenship, which Uganda has already allowed, yes. many of the Indians would like to adopt Ugandan citizenship because they will they are staying here, they are going to stay here and they will die here. And this is so own. the government of India we are asking and requesting that they should allow the dual citizenship. Also we are asking our Prime Minister that they should make a think tank called Africa Think Tank mm -hmm. from the non-resident Indians who are residing in Uganda or any parts of Africa and a policy should be made towards an Africa to support Africa and to get maximum benefit of this partnership. Mm -hmm. business bite. The former U.S. President Barack Obama urged the Kenyan youth to demand for more progress from their leaders. Obama made the remarks recently at the launch of the Saudi Coup Center in Siaya County in Kenya. Abari. It's good to be back. A young Kenyan doesn't have to do what my grandfather did and serve a foreign master. A young Kenyan doesn't have to do what my father did and leave home in order to get an education. So there's been real progress in this amazing country. And it should inspire today's young Kenyans to demand even more progress. So what we see here in Kenya is all part of an emergent, more confident, and more self-reliant Africa. But we know that real progress depends on addressing the challenges that remain. It means rooting out the corruption that weakens civic life. It means no longer seeing different ethnicities as enemies or rivals, but rather as allies and seeing the diversity of tribes not as a weakness, but as a strength. This center is going to be a place where children and young people, especially those who seek opportunity, learn the strength of their own voices. That's what Sautiku means, powerful voices. We've come to the end of the business wrap-up this week. But remember, when it comes to business, do not only think outside the box, but think like there is no box. My name is Mark Arnold Wadulo. See you next time, same place. Goodbye.